Introduction to a Traveller's Narrative Written to illustrate the episode of the Bob By Edward Granville Brown Part 1 Introduction This book is the history of a proscribed and persecuted sect Written by one of themselves After suffering in silence for nigh upon half a century they at length find voice to tell their tale and offer their apology of this voice i am the interpreter so many persian works of universally acknowledged and incontrovertible merit remain unpublished not only in europe but in the east that one who offers to the public as the result of his study and labor the translation and text of a quite recent compilation whereof the authorship must remain unknown and which must therefore rely solely on whatever intrinsic interest and merit it may possess may reasonably be expected to state the considerations which have led him to select for publication such a work this book is as i have said recent in composition for as appears from a passage which will be found on page sixty seven it was written probably during the year eighteen eighty six it is also anonymous this could not well be otherwise for what persian could with ordinary prudence acknowledge a work written in defence of a faith whereof the name is scarce mentioned in persia without fear and trembling so that these two things which some might incline to account grave defects in the book and reasons against its publication are in truth inherent in its very nature and character it is of quite modern origin because it treats of a recent movement of which the first beginnings are remembered by many still living it is anonymous because every promoter of that movement is in the country which gave it birth as a man quote, sitting beneath a sword suspended by a single hair who knoweth not when it shall descend upon him whether it shall descend instantly or after a while end quote. note see page one fifty infra end note if then the subject treated of in this book be of sufficient interest and importance to merit careful study and if the book itself notwithstanding our ignorance of its authorship can be shown to proceed from a trustworthy source i am sufficiently justified in having decided to edit and translate this traveller's narrative now it appears to me that the history of the bobby movement must be interesting in different ways to others besides those who are directly engaged in the study of persian to the student of religious thought it will afford no little matter for reflection for here he may contemplate such personalities as by lapse of time pass into heroes and demigods still unobscured by myth and fable he may examine by the light of concurrent and independent testimony one of those strange outbursts of enthusiasm faith fervent devotion and indomitable heroism or fanaticism if you will which we are accustomed to associate with the earlier history of the human race he may witness in a word the birth of a faith which may not impossibly win a place amidst the great religions of the world to the ethnologist also it may yield food for thought as to the character of a people who stigmatized as they often have been as selfish mercenary avaricious egotistical sordid and cowardly are yet capable of exhibiting 
under the influence of a strong religious impulse a degree of devotion disinterestedness generosity unselfishness nobility and courage which may be paralleled in history but can scarcely be surpassed to the politician too the matter is not devoid of importance for what changes may not be effected in a country now reckoned almost as a cipher in the balance of national forces by a religion capable of evoking so mighty a spirit let those who know what muhammad made the arabs consider well what the bab may yet make the persians but to myself and i believe to most others who have been or shall be brought to consider this matter the paramount interest thereof lies in this that here is something whether wise or unwise whether tending towards the amelioration of mankind or the reverse which seem to many hundreds if not thousands of our fellow creatures worth suffering and dying for and which on this ground alone must be accounted worthy of our most attentive study i have now to explain how this book came into my hands what so far as i have been able to learn were the causes which led to its composition and why with certain reservations which will be presently specified we are warranted in regarding it as a true and authentic account of the events which it relates in order to make this explanation clear it is necessary for me to describe briefly how my attention was first directed towards this subject how my interest in it was kindled how the means of investigating it were made available to me and how the investigation whereof this book is at present the final outcome was conducted one day some seven years ago i was searching amongst the books in the university library of cambridge for fresh materials for an essay on the sufi philosophy in the study of which i was then chiefly engaged when my eye was caught by the title of count gobineau's religions et philosophie dans l'asie centrale i took down the book glanced through it to discover whether or no it contained any account of the sufis and finding that a short chapter was devoted to them brought it back with me to my rooms my first superficial glance had also shown me that a considerable portion of the book was taken up with an account of the babis of which sect i had at that time no definite knowledge save a general idea that they had been subjected to a most severe persecution the perusal of gobineau's chapter on the sufis caused me i must frankly confess no small mortification for i was an ardent admirer of these eloquent mystics whose spirit has inspired so much of what is best and finest in persian literature and a rude shock was inflicted on my susceptibilities by such words as these le quietisme le bang et l'opium l'ivrognerie la plus abjecte voilà surtout ce qu'elle le soufisme a produit when however i turned from this mournful chapter to that portion of the book which treated of the bobby movement the case was altogether different to any one who has already read this masterpiece of historical composition this most perfect presentation of accurate and critical research in the form of a narrative of thrilling and sustained interest such as one may indeed hope to find in the drama or the romance but can scarcely expect from the historian it is needless to describe the effect 
which it produced on me to any one who has not read it i can only say let him do so forthwith if he is in any way interested in the history of the bobbies many new facts may be added to those recorded by gobineau and the history which he carried down to a d eighteen fifty two needs to be supplemented by an appendix detailing the events of the last thirty-eight years but the narrative of the first origin of barbeism can hardly be told better than he has told it certainly not in a style more eloquent nor in a manner more worthy of the subject count gobineau's book then affected in a certain sense a complete revolution in my ideas and projects i had long ardently desired to visit persia and above all shiraz and this desire was now greatly intensified but whereas i had previously wished to see shiraz because it was the home of hafez and of sa'di i now wished to see it because it was the birthplace of mirza ali muhammad the bab and after shiraz not tus and nishapur but zanjan mazandaran and tabriz were the objects of my eager desire my impatience too was greatly increased for i reflected that although there must be many still living who had witnessed or even taken part in the events of which i was so anxious to discover every slightest detail each year that passed would materially lessen their number and render even fainter the possibility of restoring the picture in its entirety besides this i was eager to know more of the doctrines which could inspire such heroism and to gain this knowledge as i clearly perceived there was but one satisfactory and effectual method as anquetil du perron had succeeded in unlocking the secrets of the zoroastrian religion by going amongst those who professed it winning their confidence and eventually after infinite patience and endeavour obtaining copies of their sacred books and a clue to their contents so i if i were to succeed in fathoming the mysteries of the bobby faith must go to the land of its origin strive to become intimate with some of its votaries and from these obtain the knowledge which i sought let no one suppose that i am so presumptuous as to institute any comparison between anquetil du perron and myself his task was one which only rare courage perseverance and genius could bring to a successful issue he had to induce the suspicious taciturn and uncommunicative priests of an ancient national religion actuated by no desire of making proselytes to impart to him a secret doctrine and ritual hitherto most jealously guarded and when at length the sacred books were gained they were books written in a language so long dead that over it had formed a deposit of commentaries in a speed which had grown flourished and died since it had been a spoken tongue added to this anquetil's investigations were conducted amidst hardships privations and dangers of an exceptional kind the barbies on the contrary would i was convinced be eager to impart their doctrines to any inquirer on whose discretion and fidelity they could place reliance their sacred books moreover were either in arabic or in persian and beyond a certain reserve and obscurity necessitated by prudential motives and a peculiar terminology such as all sects whether philosophical or religious possess i anticipated 
no particular difficulty in understanding them one special obstacle it was true did exist in this case to the primary establishment of relations of intimacy the bawbees were a proscribed sect whereof every member was practically liable to outlawry and even death should he allow his creed to become known it seemed probable enough therefore that i should at first have some difficulty in discovering them and putting myself into communication with them yet could i but find means of spending a few months in persia it would be hard i thought if some lucky chance did not bring me in contact with some bobby who would venture to take me into his confidence and if the first step could be won i relied on the fair knowledge of colloquial persian which i already possessed the general acquaintance with the bobby doctrines which gobineau's work had given me the genuine admiration which i felt for the bob and his apostles and the close brotherhood which according to all analogy must probably exist within the sect to affect the rest meanwhile the first step was to get to persia and of this there seemed to be but little chance anquetil du perron would have gone chance or no chance and either attained his object or perished in the search i not being fashioned in so heroic a mould waited for the means i made several fruitless attempts to obtain some appointment which would take me to the land of my quest and finally at a last resource offered myself as a candidate for a medical post in the realms of the nizam of haydarabad on the chance that there i might find means of visiting persia here again i was unsuccessful and i was beginning to despair of attaining my object when suddenly and unexpectedly that thing befell me which is as i believe the greatest good fortune which can fall to the lot of one eager to pursue a scientific inquiry from which he is debarred by lack of means a fellowship became vacant at my college and to this fellowship i was elected this happened on may thirtieth eighteen eighty seven five months later i had crossed the turco persian frontier and was within three stages of tabriz of the disappointments and failures which i at first met with in my attempts to discover and communicate with the bawbees of the fortunate chance which at length placed the clue in my hand and of the fulfilment of my hopes in a manner surpassing my most sanguine expectations i have already spoken in another place note journal of the royal asiatic society for eighteen eighty nine volume twenty one new series pages four eighty six to four eighty nine four ninety five to four ninety six five o one etc end note of these and other things incidental to my journey i may perhaps give a fuller account at some future time here it is sufficient for me to state that i returned to england in october eighteen eighty eight having visited zanjan tabriz shiraz and sheikh tabarsi the places most intimately associated with bobby history having lived on terms of intimacy for periods varying from a few days to many weeks with the principal bawbees at esfahan shiraz yazd and kerman and bringing with me a number of bawbi books and writings as well as journals wherein the gist of every important conversation with any member of the sect was carefully recorded so soon as i had established myself once more in the college which four years absence from cambridge and a year's travelling in persia had served to render yet more dear to me i set to work to make a systematic examination of the materials collected during my journey the persian bayan the iqan the kitab aqdas the epistles to the kings the tarikh jadid and a host of more or less important letters memoranda 
poems and abstracts were read digested and indexed and the outcome of this and my previous labour together with a brief account of my journey was laid before the public in two articles comprising in all one hundred seventy pages of which the first appeared in july the second in october eighteen eighty nine in the journal of the royal asiatic society to these articles i shall continually have occasion to refer in the course of this work and for the sake of brevity i shall henceforth generally denote them as b one and b two the preparation of these articles in conjunction with other work kept me occupied till the autumn of eighteen eighty nine when the main results of my investigations having been satisfactorily recorded i was left at liberty to turn my attention to matters of detail it appeared to me extremely desirable that texts or translations of the chief bobby works should be published in extenso the only question was which to begin with inasmuch as it seemed likely that the historical aspects of the movement would prove more generally interesting than its doctrinal aspects i finally determined to publish first the text and translation of the tawrikh jadid note concerning the tawrikh jadid see note a at end pages one ninety two to one ninety seven infra end note and this determination was approved by several of my friends and correspondents whose knowledge entitled them to speak with authority this text and translation i accordingly began to prepare and the former was completely copied out for the printer awaiting only collation with the british museum text note this collation has since been effected and the variants offered by the british museum manuscript prove to be both numerous and important should the publication of the work be proceeded with it would be necessary to collate also the defective manuscript recently acquired by the st petersburg library the closing words of which occur on page two thirty five of my manuscript see note one at the foot of page one ninety two infra and the forthcoming sixth volume of baron rosen's collection scientifique page two forty four end note while the latter was in an advanced stage of progress when circumstances immediately to be detailed occurred which postponed the completion of that work and substituted for it another the present my researches amongst the bobbies in persia had at a comparatively early stage revealed to me the fact that since count gobineau composed his work great changes had taken place in their organization and attitude i had expected to find mirza yahya subh azal hazrat azal as gobineau calls him universally acknowledged by them as the bob's successor and the sole head to whom they confessed allegiance my surprise was great when i discovered that so far from this being the case the majority of bobbies spoke only of baha as their chief and prophet asserted that the bob was merely his herald and forerunner those who had read the gospels and they were many likened the bob to john the baptist and baha to christ and either entirely ignored or strangely disparaged mirza yahya it took me some time fully to grasp this new and unexpected position of affairs and perhaps i should not have succeeded in doing so had it not been for the knowledge of the former state of things which i had obtained from gobineau's work and the acquaintance which i subsequently made in kerman of five or six persons who adhered to what i may call the quote, old dispensation end quote, and regarded mirza yahya subh azal as the legitimate and sole successor of the bob to state briefly a long story the case stands thus one mirza ali muhammad the bob during his life chose from amongst his most faithful and most gifted disciples eighteen persons called the letters of the living who together with himself the point 
nokte constituted the sacred hierarchy of nineteen called the first unity vahed aval of these letters i have not been able to obtain a complete list and indeed it would appear that the whole hierarchy was never made known mirza yahya subh azal held the fourth place in this hierarchy and on the death of the point and the two first letters rose by a natural process of promotion to the position of chief of the sect note c note one on page ninety five infra end note baha whose proper name is mirza hossein ali of nur was also according to gobineau note religions et philosophie page two seventy seven end note included in the unity gobineau has however mistaken the relationship which existed between him and mirza yahya that the two are brothers or rather half-brothers born of the same father by different wives is a fact established by convincing testimony note compare pages fifty six note two sixty three top and three seventy three end note two mirza ali muhammad the bab declared explicitly and repeatedly in all his works that the religion established by him and the books revealed to him were in no way final that his followers must continually expect the advent of him whom god shall manifest who would perfect and complete this religion that though he whom god shall manifest would not it was hoped delay his appearance for more than one thousand five hundred eleven or at most two thousand one years these numbers being represented in kabbalistic fashion by the words rieth and musteroth he might appear at any time and that whenever one should appear claiming to be he whom god shall manifest his very being together with his power of revealing verses would be his sufficient signs all who believed in the bab were solemnly warned not to reject one so characterized and making such a claim and were commanded in case of doubt to incline towards belief rather than disbelief three during the sojourn of the bobby exiles at adrianople baha according to nabil in a d eighteen sixty six to seven suddenly claimed to be he whom god shall manifest in proof of which he revealed sundry signs ere yet in eloquent arabic and persian wherein he summoned all the babis to acknowledge him as their supreme and sole chief and spiritual guide most of the babis eventually made this acknowledgment vowed allegiance to baha and thereby became bahais some few refused to transfer their allegiance from mirza yahya subh azal who himself strenuously resisted baha's claims which he regarded in the light of an usurpation and rebellion and these were thenceforth known as azalis thus did the great schism take place which divided the babis into two unequal parties a large majority of whose unbounded and almost incredible love and reverence the object is baha a small minority whose eager gaze is directed not to acre in syria but to famagusta in cyprus where dwells the exiled chief whom they refuse to disavow needless is it to say how bitter is the animosity which subsists between the bahais and the azalis amongst both factions i have found good men and faithful friends and from the chiefs of both and their sons i have met with much kindness wherefore i would for the present touch as lightly as may be on this painful matter leaving my readers to draw their own conclusions from what is hereinafter set forth the general nature of the arguments for and against either side will be found summarized at pages five fourteen and five fifteen of my first 
and pages 997 to 998 of my second article on the Babis in the JRAS, to which I refer such of my readers as are curious to examine the matter more minutely. Of one thing there can, in my opinion, be but little doubt. The future, if Babiism, as I most firmly believe, has a future, belongs to Baha and his successors and followers. With most of the facts summarized above, I became acquainted during my sojourn in Persia, but I was unable to learn for certain whether Mirza Yahya Subh Azal was still alive, nor could I ascertain in what part of Cyprus he had fixed his residence. A dervish with whom I became acquainted in Kerman told me that he had visited him, but could not remember the name of the town wherein he dwelt, and none of the Azalis whom I saw could give me any more precise information. In my first paper on the Babis in the JRAS, pages 516 to 517, I was therefore compelled to confess my failure in all attempts to elucidate this point. At the same time, I pointed out how much precious information might be gained from Subh Azal if he were still alive, and how extremely desirable it was in the interests of science that this matter should be cleared up. After the publication of my first, and during the preparation of my second paper, I began to institute inquiries on this point. My sister, who was then travelling in the east, succeeded in obtaining the first clue from Mr. G. I. Houston, who was kind enough to procure for me definite proof that Subh Azal was still alive, and was residing with his family at Famagusta. Shortly after this, my friend Dr. F. H. H. Guillemard, who had spent many months in Cyprus and had friends in all parts of the island, very obligingly wrote to Mr. C. D. Cobham, commissioner at Larnaca, and to Captain Young, commissioner at Famagusta, asking them to obtain for me the fullest information possible relative to the Bobby exiles in Cyprus. I myself wrote at the same time, stating the nature of the information which I sought. Both Captain Young and Mr. Cobham responded to my request with a kindness for which I cannot sufficiently express my gratitude. And so vigorously and energetically did they push their inquiries that I was soon in possession of all the chief facts relating to the Bobby exiles. Captain Young, indeed, spared no pains to clear up every point connected with the inquiry. The day after he received my letter, he paid a visit to Subh Azal, questioned him concerning his life, his adventures, and his doctrines, asked for information on sundry points mentioned in my paper, and forwarded to me a complete account of all that he had learned nor was this all for he succeeded so well in winning subh azal's confidence that with this first letter dated july twenty eighth eighteen eighty nine he was able to forward a manuscript of one of the bob's works whereof so far as i know no copy had previously reached europe through captain young i was able to address directly to subh azal letters containing questions on numerous matters connected with the history doctrine and literature of the Babis, to all of which letters i received most full and courteous replies subh azal further sent me at different times several other manuscripts a complete list of such of the bob's works as had been in his possession at baghdad note c note u at end end note and a brief history of the bobby movement written by himself besides numerous letters each one of which contained most precious information this correspondence which opened out so rich a mine of new facts was but in an early stage when my second paper on the bobbies was published in the j r a s for october eighteen eighty nine but i was able to add to it an appendix 
pages 994 to 998, embodying the more important results of the inquiry undertaken by Captain Young, Mr. Cobham, and Mr. Houston. A fuller and more accurate account of Subh Azal and the other Babi exiles in Cyprus, based on the inquiries of the above mentioned gentlemen, the examination of official documents, and the statements made to me by Subh Azal, his sons, and others, will be found in note W at the end of this book. It is therefore unnecessary for me to allude further to this correspondence at present. While I was in Persia, I had already formed the intention of visiting Acre and learning the doctrine of Baha from the fountain head. From the moment when I discovered that Subh Azal was still alive, I further resolved to visit him also, for from repeated personal interviews I anticipated results which could not be obtained by a correspondence, however elaborate. I was also anxious for my own satisfaction to see those who since the Bob's death had been the leaders of the Bobby movement. Without this I felt that my researches would lack that completeness which I wished to give them. The motives which impelled me towards Acre and Famagusta were equally strong, but somewhat different. At the former place, I expected to see the mainspring and fulcrum of a mighty force, with the outstanding results of which I had become practically acquainted in Persia, and from which I believed, as I still believe, that results yet more wonderful might be expected in the future. At the latter place, I hoped to converse with one whom the Bob had recognized as his immediate successor and vice-regent, one who had been personally acquainted with Mulla Hussein of Bushra Wei, Mulla Sheikh Ali, Suleiman Khan, Qurratul Ain, and, in short, almost all of those whose devoted lives and heroic deaths had first inspired my enthusiasm, one, moreover, who represented the spirit and tradition of the old Barbeism, which, in the hands of Baha, had already undergone important modifications, and, indeed, become almost a new religion. Various considerations decided me to visit Cyprus first, of which two only need be mentioned here. Firstly, it was practically certain that no obstacle to my seeing Subh Azal would arise, while it was by no means certain that I should be able to see Baha. Secondly, the logical order of procedure was to begin with the investigation of the old order of things, and having completed this, to continue the examination of the new. I hoped, however, to make one journey suffice for the attainment of both objects, but allowing for the time which must be consumed in actual travelling, it was clear that at least two months would be required for the enterprise. The long vacation was amply sufficient for the purpose, but the summer was the most unsustainable season for such a journey, and I therefore determined to petition the university for such extension of leave at Easter as would enable me to absent from England for two months. The university, ever ready to facilitate research of every kind, granted me permission to absent myself from Cambridge from March 4th till May 3rd, 1890, and accordingly, leaving England on the date first mentioned, I landed at Larnaca in Cyprus on March 19th. Captain Young and Mr. Cobham, on becoming acquainted with my intention of visiting Cyprus, had, with that ready kindness and hospitality which, so far as my experience goes, are rarely lacking in Englishmen resident in the East, written to ask me to be their guest 
during such time as i might desire to remain in famagusta or larnaca so that i was entirely relieved of all anxiety as to the possibility of finding a base of operations for my researches captain young further counselled me in case i wished to gain access to the official records of the island government to obtain before leaving england such letters of recommendation as might ensure the attainment of this object i accordingly applied for help in obtaining these to major general sir frederick goldsmid whose long residence in persia and intimate knowledge of the persian people and language had led him to take some interest in my communications on the subject of the barbies to the royal asiatic society he spared no pains to further my plans and introduced me to sir robert biddulph who very kindly gave me a letter to sir henry bulwer the governor-general of cyprus asking him to allow me so far as might be permissible or expedient to inspect such official documents as might throw light on the object of my investigations in larnaca i spent only one day the shortness of the time at my disposal and my eagerness to see subh azal compelling me with great reluctance to forgo the pleasure which a more prolonged sojourn under mr cobham's hospitable roof would have afforded me the day passed most pleasantly for in my host i found not only an accomplished oriental scholar and a traveller to whom few regions of the habitable globe were unknown but a genial friend and a warm sympathizer in my researches mr cobham had studied persian for some time with mushkin Kalam, one of the bahai exiles sent with subh azal to cyprus note concerning mushkin Kalam, c b one page five sixteen b two pages nine ninety four to nine ninety five and note w at end end note and from him had learned much concerning the new religion subh azal however he had not seen for mushkin Kalam, as was natural had spoken only of baha and had entirely ignored the existence of a chief whose authority he disavowed on the following day thursday march twentieth eighteen ninety i bade farewell to mr cobham and after some six hours spent in a somewhat antiquated vehicle belonging to a loquacious italian who had fought for garibaldi found myself at famagusta or rather its suburb varoshia where i met with a most cordial welcome from captain and lady evelyn young captain young at once sent a message to subh azal's son abdul ali who keeps a shop in varoshia requesting him to come to the Konaq. in a short time he appeared and i was much struck by the refinement of his manner the intelligence revealed by his countenance and conversation and the courteousness of his address our conversation was conducted in persian which though he had never been in persia he spoke as his mother tongue it was soon arranged that i should visit subh azal on the following day at whatever time he should appoint next morning we received a message to the effect that subh azal was prepared to receive us as soon as we could come at about eleven a m therefore captain young drove me into the town which is situated about a mile from the suburb of varoshia as i had not entered within the walls of famagusta on the preceding day i now saw for the first time the massive fortifications the multitudinous churches whereof the number as is currently reported by the inhabitants equals the number of days in the year and the desolate neglected streets of that most interesting relic of the middle ages after captain young had transacted some other business we proceeded to subh azal's abode in the courtyard of which we were received by his sons abdul ali rezvan ali abdul wahed and taqiyuddin 
and an old Babi of Zanjan, who had settled in the island so as to be near his master. Accompanied by these, with the exception of the last mentioned, we ascended to an upper room, where a venerable and benevolent-looking old man of about sixty years of age, somewhat below the middle height, with ample forehead on which long-cherished desire was fulfilled, I stood face to face with Mirza Yahya Sobhe Azal, the morning of eternity, the appointed successor of the Bab, the fourth letter of the first unity. This my first interview was necessarily short and somewhat formal, for I had yet to win the confidence of Sobhe Azal, and induce him, little by little, to speak without reserve of those things whereof I so earnestly desired to hear. In this, thanks to the confidence with which Captain Young's kindness had already inspired Sobhe Azal, and the very vivid picture of the chief actors in the Bobby movement, which, first derived from the perusal of Count Gobineau's work, had continued to glow and glow in my mind, till it became almost as a part of my personal experience, I was completely successful. During the fortnight which I spent at Famagusta, I visited Subhe Azal daily, remaining with him as a rule from two or three o'clock in the afternoon until sunset. Lack of space forbids me from describing in detail and consecutive order the conversations which took place on these occasions. Notebook and pencil in hand, I sat before him day by day, and every evening I returned to Verocia with a rich store of new facts, most of which will be found recorded in the notes wherewith I have striven to illustrate or check the statements advanced in the following pages. Apart from the delight inseparable from successful research, my stay at Famagusta was a very pleasant one, for from every one with whom I came in contact, but most of all from Captain and Lady Evelyn Young, I met with a kindness which I can never forget. Besides my visits to Sobhe Azal in the afternoon, I often spent some portion of the morning with his son Abdul Ali, and we were sometimes joined by Rezvan Ali, or by one or other of the few Azalis who have settled in Famagusta. During these conversations I learned many new facts of greater or less importance. The reserve which had at first been apparent in Sobhe Azal gradually disappeared, and at each successive interview I found him more communicative. Although our conversation was chiefly on religious topics and the history, biography, doctrine and literature of the Babis, other matters were occasionally discussed of the bob and his few apostles and followers as of his own life and adventures subh azal would speak freely but concerning the origin of the schism which for him had been attended with such disastrous results and all pertaining to baha and the baha'is he was most reticent so that perceiving this subject to be distasteful i refrained for the most part from alluding to it. During these conferences, Sobhe Azal's sons were always present, though they hardly spoke in the presence of their father, towards whom they observed the utmost deference and respect. Tea was always served in the Persian fashion, but tobacco in all forms was conspicuous by its absence. The Azalis, unlike the Baha'is, following the injunctions of the Bab in this matter in the course of each visit or sometimes when i was leaving the house subhe azal's youngest son taqiyuddin a pretty graceful child about thirteen years of age used to present me with a little bunch of roses or such other flowers as the modest garden attached to the house would afford on my walk to and from famagusta i was always accompanied by Abdul Ali, and often by one of his brothers. A few days after my arrival in Famagusta, I wrote to Sir Henry Bulwer, 
stating what was my object in desiring to examine the official records concerning the exiles which might be presented at nicosia asking whether i might be permitted to do so and forwarding the letter of recommendation given me by sir robert biddulph in response to my request sir henry bulwer having learnt that the shortness of my stay in the island made it difficult if not impossible for me to visit nicosia was kind enough to forward for my perusal all the more important papers bearing on the subject all of these therefore i was able to examine at my leisure and of all of them with one exception i received permission to make use an abstract of the important facts and dates established by these documents will be found in note w at the end of this book the fifth of april which was the ultimate limit whereunto my stay in cyprus could be protracted unless i were prepared to postpone indefinitely my visit to acre came at last on the morning of that day therefore having with great reluctance bade farewell to all my kind friends i left famagusta and embarked the same afternoon at larnaca on the messagerie steamer gironde i passed a pleasant evening with a turkish official and a syrian who were the only other passengers besides myself and early next morning awoke to find myself at beirut as i had now but two weeks at my disposal ere i must again turn my face homewards i was naturally anxious to proceed as soon as possible to acre especially as i learned that should i fail to find a steamer bound directly for that port three days at least would be consumed by the journey thither it was however necessary for me first to obtain permission from the bobby headquarters for though i could without doubt proceed to acre if i so pleased without consulting any one's inclination save my own it was certain that unless my journey had previously received the sanction of baha it would in all probability result in naught but failure and disappointment now there reside at beirut port said and alexandria by one of which places all desirous of proceeding to acre by sea must of necessity pass babis of consequence to whom all desirous of visiting baha must in the first instance apply should such application prove successful the applicant is informed that he may proceed on his journey and receives such instruction advice and assistance as may be necessary to the bobby agent at beirut whose name i do not feel myself at liberty to mention i had a letter of recommendation from one of his relatives with whom i had become acquainted in persia the first thing which i did on my arrival was to send a messenger to discover his abode the messenger shortly returned saying that he had indeed succeeded in finding the place indicated but that the agent was absent from beirut this was a most serious blow to my hopes for time was against me and every day was of vital importance there was nothing for it however but to make the best of the matter and i therefore went in person to the abode of the absent agent and presented myself to his deputy who opened and attentively perused my letter of recommendation and then informed me that his master was at acre and was not expected back for ten days or a fortnight in reply to my anxious inquiries as to how i had best proceed he advised me to write a letter to his master explaining the state of the case which letter together with the letter of recommendation he undertook to forward at once as the post fortunately chanced to be leaving for acre that very evening i at once wrote as he directed and then returned to my lodging with the depressing consciousness that at least five or six days must elapse ere i could receive an answer to my letter or start for acre that even if permission was granted as no steamer appeared likely to be sailing 
three more days would be spent in reaching my goal and that consequently eight or nine days out of the fourteen still remaining to me would be wasted before i could even set foot in the land of my quest altogether i began to fear that the second part of my journey was likely to prove far less successful than the first fortunately matters turned out much better than i expected in the first place i made the acquaintance of mr eyres the british vice-consul whose kindness and hospitality did much to render my stay at beirut pleasant and who on learning that i wished to proceed to acre told me that he himself intended to start for acre and haifa on the following friday april eleventh and that i might if i pleased accompany him in the second place it occurred to me that i might save two or three days to lay by telegraphing to acre so soon as my letter must in the natural course of things have reached its destination and requesting a telegram in reply to inform me whether i might proceed thither on wednesday april ninth therefore i sent a telegram to this effect on thursday evening returning after sunset to my hotel from a ride in the hills i was met with the welcome news that a persian had called twice to see me during the afternoon stating that he had important business which would not brook delay and that he had left a note for me which i should find upstairs from this note hurriedly scribbled in pencil on a scrap of paper i learned that permission had been granted and that i was free to start as soon as i pleased on receiving this intelligence my first action was to verify it beyond all doubt by calling at once on the deputy of the absent agent whom i fortunately found at home he congratulated me warmly on the happy issue of my affairs and handed over to me the original telegram it was laconic in the extreme containing besides the address two words only yet the wajahul musafir let the traveller approach he then informed me that as no steamer was starting for acre i must of necessity proceed thither by land and that the reason why he had been so anxious to communicate with me earlier was that the post left that day at sundown and i might have accompanied it i then told him of mr eyre's kind offer which as we agreed was a most exceptional piece of good fortune for me inasmuch as he proposed to start on the following morning and expected to reach acre on april thirteenth after bidding farewell to the deputy agent and thanking him for the effectual aid which he had so rendered me i visited mr eyres and told him that i would accept his kind offer if i could obtain a horse and make the necessary arrangements for my journey on the following morning he told me that he must start early but that if i left beirut by midday i could easily overtake him at sidon where he would halt for the night and he further placed at my disposal the services of one of his kawwases to assist me in my preparations next morning friday eleventh i was astir early for there was much to be done with the help of my friend jamaluddin bey of the imperial ottoman bank and the active cooperation of the kawwas of the consulate all was at length satisfactorily arranged and shortly after midday i found myself on a sturdy good-looking but somewhat indolent horse with a khurjin pair of saddle-bags containing the most indispensable of my effects behind me plodding along a sandy road bordered with cactus in the direction of sidon where the road being fortunately easy to follow i arrived without mishap at sundown to speak of the delights of that three days journey the beauty of the scenery the purity and fragrance of the soft spring air the pleasant midday halts by some rippling stream or in some balmy grove 
and the hospitable receptions accorded to me as mr eyre's travelling companion by those in whose houses we alighted at sidon tyre and acre would be to wander further than is permissible from the subject in hand suffice it to say that thanks to mr eyre's kindness in allowing me to accompany him a journey which if performed in solitude would have lost more than half its charm was rendered enjoyable in the highest degree the last day was perhaps the most delightful of all and i was greatly astonished on entering the acre plain to behold a wealth of beautiful gardens and fragrant orange groves such as i had little expected to find in what baha has stigmatized as quote, the most desolate of countries end quote. Ekhrebul bilad. i subsequently mentioned this feeling of surprise to the babis at acre who replied that had i seen it when baha first came there nearly two and twenty years ago i would not have deemed the title misapplied but that since he had dwelt there it had assumed this fair and comely aspect end of introduction to a traveller's narrative by edward granville brown part one recording by nicholas james bridgewater